Hello, everyone. Thank you so much hey. for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Chris Miller, the co-director of the Russia and Eurasia program here at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And I'm very excited uh, to have a very distinguished uh, guest today, Leonid Volko, who is chief of staff for Alexei Navalny, and also this semester a world fellow at Yale University. He's going to join us today to talk about the future of Russia's political opposition. So Lena's going to talk for about half an hour and then open it up for uh, questions. Um, we do have really lots of questions and discussion after that. So I think the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you, Chris, for being here. And thank you everyone for coming. I mean, the weather is so nice and it <laughs> makes me a little bit like, well, puzzled. Like, what, why should I, why like, should it be in such a competition? But, well, hopefully we'll spend interesting time together. I see people very various, well, agents around. Some, some of you definitely speak Russian, some of you definitely not. So I have to presume you have also different knowledge and understanding of Russian politics, of Russian opposition politics. So, uh, Q and A is always the most interesting part of such an event, but I still have to spend some time to kind of try to synchronize all of you before jumping to questions and answers. Uh, uh, just to be sure that everyone is well, somewhere on the same page. Uh, so I'll spend some time to explain some background of who I am, why I'm here, and why I'm talking on this topic. Uh, and I have to apologize uh, to, to those who are well aware of uh, all this Matters. So my name is Leonid Volkov. I live now in Moscow, well now in New Haven, Connecticut, for this semester as a Yale World Fellow. It's a it's a non-degree program. They select like 16 people every year to bring them on, on Yale campus for a semester to integrate them to, to Yale community. So I'm not uh, learning anything at Yale more. And not actually teaching, but there is a lot of like, seminars, roundtables, talks, a lot of communication with the community. And if uh, someone would ask me like why I'm doing this, what was the value, I would say that I see a large, very natural, very large uh, generation gap, and those people doing policy on Russia here in the U.S. Like there are people who used to do it. Before the end of the Cold War, now there are a lot of people new to this area, and there are not so many people who did this in the last 25 years. Uh, so I see that people there at Yale, here at Fletcher, at Columbia, where I uh, keep talking a couple of things, and other places like this are probably the future policymakers on Russia here in the US, and it's important for me to, well, give uh, our viewpoint, our stance on what's going on, where it goes, because now I see a real lack of understanding of what's going on in Russia, here on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's probably, yeah, for me it's important that this uh, gap will be somehow covered. Uh, in Russia, I work as a chief of staff and campaign manager for Alexei Navalny, the leader of Russian opposition, the Yale World Fellow of 2010 himself. Uh, Alexei was running for mayor of Moscow in 2013. I was his campaign manager. Uh, <coughs> it, it was a very surprising uh, election. We started with uh, three percent approval rating against 75 for the incumbent mayor and we nearly forced this election into a, a runoff. The official results were, were, were like 51 to 28. The actual results were probably like 45 to 36 according to exit polls which would result in the second round of election but then a little magic happened in, on the election night it was 51 for the incumbent mayor. But still, this is well, widely considered as the largest electoral success of opposition in, <coughs> in the last well, 30 years. 
2018, we had presidential election, and a year and a half in advance, in fall 2016, we launched a presidential campaign, or more precisely, an attempt to get Alexei registered as a, presiden as a presidential candidate for the upcoming election. Uh, to fulfill the formal requirement and to create political pressure necessary to have a chance to get him registered on the ballot, uh, we built a large political organization, uh, 85 campaign offices over Russia's 11 time zones, over uh, 60, 65, 67 out of Russia's 85 regions. So really a large network of political operations unprecedented in the history of Russian opposition politics. We uh, hired, we crowdfunded uh, over six million US dollars over the course of this year and a half, which is pretty much, I think, a budget of a Senate race here, but something really also unheard of for the opposition politics uh, in Russia. Uh, we spent this money to hire over 350 campaign staff who managed over 200,000 volunteers uh, engaged in this political operation all over the country. Uh, on one hand, this has probably not been a very successful campaign because as it was at the end of the day not allowed to run, he was not on the ballot in the March 18th uh, re-election of President Putin. Uh, well, probably also because the pressure he created was too hard and they considered the risk of letting him run after this. Uh, risk too high today. Uh, still, we managed to keep the core of our uh, regional network. I'm still in charge of operating 45 of regional political offices of our organization. You can call it the Anti-Corruption Foundation or just the well, political force of Alexei Navalny or the Progress Party, the Russia's Future Party. It's not that important uh, how exactly you name it. Just this is an only independent and strong uh, 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 political force in Russia. I mean, just the, the only one real anti-Putin uh, political force. And we continue our operations and those 45 cities, of course, including Moscow. And we were able to organize several very large scale uh, anti Putin rallies. Uh, in, uh, the last one was September 9th uh, this year, so a month ago, not exactly a month ago, because, yeah, I know it perfectly because today uh, three of our regional campaign coordinators have been released from jail because they usually send you to jail for certain days for organizing opposition rallies. So today we had a guy in Khabarovsk, in uh, Novosibirsk, and somewhere else released. So it denotes this is exactly 30 days from the last large rally. And, uh, well, Russia is not the country where you can rely on opinion polls or on some other tools normally used to, to measure uh, politics, to understand politics. People don't tend to provide honest answers to the pollsters. And, well, there are no free media in the country, and so on and so on. So, we have to judge about the efficiency of our political operations using some indirect methods. And this is where the third Newtonian law helps us a lot. We can measure the amount of efforts Kremlin 
puts the press on us to well to arrest our people to try to well, suppress our political uh, operations in the regions and so on and so on. This amount of efforts is very large. I would say that the well <coughs> the largest part of Kremlin political machine uh, is, is busy fighting uh, against what we are doing and this makes us think that we are doing our job quite well. So, uh, I'm still in charge of our political operations uh, while here at Yale, but of course uh, not anymore that hands-on. So I've spent a year and a half literally like 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week, very hands-on, very uh, operational, like when you have 350 stuff, you have to always resolve this conflict or that conflict, hire people, fire people, uh, solve some small problems here and there, answer hundreds of emails every day. So uh, now, of course, I delegated a lot and I actually trying to use this semester at Yelp to, re to, to regain some of the well, bigger picture. Uh, I mean, if you are so involved in daily operations, you hardly have time to think about well, where it actually goes. So I, I've spent already two months here in New England, so in a much more relaxed way of uh, living than I used to in Russia under less stress. Well, I myself have been uh, detained seven times for organizing the rallies during our campaign and was arrested five times, spent 95 days uh, in jail altogether so during the last year. So now, enjoying nice weather and pizza, I have a, uh, of course, very natural, I have like salts, not about like to whom to uh, hire tomorrow, but more about what where should we be in, in two years or in five years from now, and that's why I'm here to share this sort of this this year. So it's a, it's a very good moment to talk about like of the future of Russia's opposition, not about what the Russian opposition is going to do in a week. And actually, I consider the future of Russian opposition very optimistic. We are doing good. I mean, Alexei is now in jail himself. Uh, he got a record winning 50 days of uh, arrest because of the last rally. He will be released only on Sunday. And uh, our regional offices are facing enormous pressure. Uh, and of course the level of unfreedom in the media is growing every day. And the line of what's allowed and what's not anymore allowed is moving very fast and unpredictable. You can't imagine people getting arrested for a peaceful rally in Russia seven years ago. You, you couldn't imagine people getting arrested for a retweet or for a repost two years ago. So it's it's always something new. The laws are not changing, just the, the uh, application of those laws is changing very fast. And you can hardly say what's, what's safe now and what will be safe tomorrow. And still, things are looking the perspective, I mean, the long-term perspective, is looking really as good as it never did before. Why? I'm proud to say that, uh, I mean, now a lot of experts uh, speculate around this as well. Uh, Putin is having hard times, his approval ratings are going down because of the retirement age reform you might have heard about, and so on, so on. but not many of the experts and so-called experts said so before. 
the presidential election. The real point. But you can easily find my uh, uh, talks or articles on this dating from 2017. My point was, after getting re-elected, Putin will face his most complicated time ever. I can compare the situation, if you recall, with uh, Yeltsin's re-election in 1996. So, Yeltsin almost died five hard strokes on the campaign trail, really uh, made enormous effort to dance his way through the re-election and probably he was feeling like really relaxed after July 1996 but the most complicated times only started after 1996 the default, the five prime ministers within 15 months all internal turbulence and struggle fight of the different parts of the political alliance only, only started. Why? Well, because he was a lame duck. No one considered a probability he would be running again in 2000. And so he actually had no more authority, no more voice in any decisions about the future. So the political alliance were to determine the future of post Yeltsin's Russia, but not himself. He was not anymore a strong player. And so he was actually losing the grip of the steering wheel. Of the steering wheel. I, would, I predicted that something similar will happen to Putin after March 2018. And I would say that what I observe now, what we observe now in Russia, seems to prove this prediction has been correct. It's a question if Putin will decide to, to run or not to run in 2024. Well, there are pros and contras. Uh, pros, well, of course, he is definitely set not to leave Kremlin other than in, in a coffin. I mean, he, he really, I mean, well, he's a dictator. He wants to rule uh, forever. But on the, other, on, the, on the other hand, well, he already gave an example that there are some rules he wants to obey. He didn't run for his, for his third term in 28. He, in, <clears throat> he invented some, some operation with an interim president, the day defense, and so on and so on. So it will, it will be a bit complicated to explain why he is not following the same uh, way again in 2024. Maybe he will decide to rewrite the constitution. Actually, just today we had the news that the uh, uh, chairman of the constitutional court announced there is going to be a constitutional reform. Maybe they will invent some other workaround, another interim president, some, something like this. But at least for the first time, there is a doubt. There is, and the, the political elite is considering what's going to be next. Before that, their strategy was to invest everything in Putin's approval rate. So very basically, how was Russia operated? How was Russia run? It, it was, and it, it is, well, a very typical mafia state. So we have Mr. Putin as a mafia boss. We have his lieutenants. These lieutenants are responsible, this one for oil, this one for gas, this one for, I don't know, for uh, cocaine, and this one for uh, uh, building roads and bridges. And uh, this is very well divided. And if they have conflicts, they come to the boss. And, well, who gives which? Uh, well, if this guy con controls, the, I don't know, the ports, and this guy controls the drugs, and, well, how do they share proceeds of uh, drugs being trafficked through the ports? This is, this Putin would decide and say, well, you stay here, you stay here, this is fair, and so on. 
and this has been an, a very effective collective strategy. So, in every particular case, the guy with the drugs, or the guy with the ports, or the guy with the oil, would probably be a little bit upset. But in general, the structure kept running because it had legitimacy. So Putin had his approval rating. There is no trust. No, no institution in Russia has any approval rating. There is no trust in any political party, in, in church, in government, in uh, governors. They are all, well, hated and despised. They are legitimate only by the reason Putin appointed him. And, well, Putin is, or was, very popular. Indeed, I mean, it's true. So, it was a good strategy for them to invest everything in his approval rating and to rely on his decisions, on, the, on him as a highest referee, on his arbitrage. Well, this decision could be considered not very fair by the oil guy, and that decision could be considered not, not very fair by the drug guy, but in general, the system kept running and they didn't need any other way to resolve their conflicts and struggles and problems. Now, this is changing. <clears throat> the Sechen Ulukaev case, which happened a year ago, is something that couldn't have happened 10 years ago, or 5 years ago, or even 3 years ago. Two of top lieutenants of such a top level uh, deciding their conflict in openly in front of the public, not in Putin's office in Kremlin, but using some other, some, some other tools, like going to court uh, to decide their conflict, it's, it's something unheard of because it's actually, well, it undermines the authority of power. It definitely uh, has a negative impact of overall approval ratings of everyone. But still, for some reason, they decided not to use the internal and informal mechanisms of arbitrage they had before. Now, the fight between uh, FSB and investigative committee, uh, committee, some other things are happening that couldn't have happened five years ago. Why? Because they, it looks they, they start thinking of new mechanisms for resolution of those conflicts. Because they have to. Now, well, and before, all these mechanisms have been very, very informal. Like, okay, Putin has said this and this, we obey, that's good, it's perfectly legitimate because Putin is legitimate, that's all. He's getting older. Uh, the political ally as a whole isn't getting older. So the gap is increasing. Like, the mid-level operationals, the ministers or governors are always like, 45 or 50 years old. Putin is getting older. So if I am a Putin's lieutenant and I am well, 50 and he is 60, I can think about, like, okay, uh, here is an informal decision. I'll obey to this decision. It's, it's uh, my profit also. And I don't care what happens in, 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 in 20 years. When this gap is growing, and if I'm like a 40 years old governor and there is a 70 years old president, I have to think about my post Putin strategy. Okay, I'm getting this asset, this, I don't know, oil plant, by a very informal decision, not based on any court order, not based on any legitimate procedure, just, just because Putin ordered so. But how I'll be able to keep it after? It starts become a question, it starts to become an issue. And this actually denotes that Putin is, well, starting to get a, a lame duck as well, as, as, as the Yeltsin was in It's a slow process. It's of course not like just, just, just a click and 
switch. But it's definitely something that we are able to observe now. Uh, so prior to that, their strategy was only to, to invest in his approval rate. So whatever having good propaganda used this to build up Putin's approval. Whatever having bad, it was blamed on, on the others. Like the village of the government, the governors, oh, or the well, the Western world, whatever. It isn't pretty much working anymore. Yeah, first of all, because uh, there is there are no no others to blame. I mean, they have spoiled all the approval rating of any other institution. You can't you can't deduct any more points from Medvedev's approval rating to 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 spare to save some Putin's approval rating because Medvedev has no more. And most uh, and to, to to a very large extent due to our political operations. <clears throat> On the other hand, once again, the political alive starts thinking about conservation of its assets, of its resources, of its areas of influence after Putin. And it's not more such a profitable. <coughs> such a profitable strategy for them to invest in Putin, to invest in his rating. They have to start thinking about inventing some other mechanisms that would help them. Uh, and that's why he seems to, to lose all his well, Teflon protection he used to have. So suddenly he has to take fire on himself Defending the retirement age reform. Well, we had there was a very easy, um, very, uh, we, we can compare it to the uh, monetization of 2005, which has been a very unpopular reform as well. But Putin just didn't say a word. So I mean, this was a bad government doing this unpopular reform. Putin was. On the horse, I, I, I didn't know. Whatever. <laughs> so he was just not doing this, but government. Now it doesn't work anymore. He had to speak loud himself to get blamed for this, to 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 spoil like 20 points of his approval rating, to protect this reform himself. No one wanted to to take this blow on him. The same with the, with the Skripal poisoning case. I mean, four years ago, on the point of age 17, Putin never said a word. He just never said a word. So not, not to be caught lying, not to look stupid, not to, not to take any damage. Now, for some reason, and I would consider that this is a deep change in the behavior and the attitude of the life, he had to take all the damage himself. He had to, well, uh, step up, get caught lying, say very stupid things that are not that are, well, considered stupid even for the very hard for and supporters. Because, well, they're too obviously uh, a stupid lie. So, this is a change. This could take years, definitely. But still, it's happening. And makes me very optimistic. Now, this is a strategy. What's important is that we believe very deeply that the system Putin has built, the regime he has constructed, couldn't be inherited. Also because it's very, very much built on very personal relations, uh, promises, deals, and so on. I mean, most of the large decisions on distributing assets and oil and gas, aluminium, potassium and whatever were made informal. Like what was the legal reason to to steal Bashnev from Yvtoshenko? There was no. Just like put in sword. And this decision did not stay after after he's gone. For for, for, for any reason. So there will be a, a fight 
quite a dramatic one of any one against any one for for for, for everyone against everyone for for the succession for the succession, and there is no clear mechanism for for him to, to inherit the system he has constructed. We, we, we know it quite good from from the the world's history. Uh, the this planet has seen quite a few of the regimes very similar to Putin's, like well, uh, kleptoc kleptocracy, being authoritarian, and being still quite successful because of the high prices for natural resources. And almost none of them have been successful in character. No, not the Spartans in Indonesia, not the Pinochet of Chile, not the um, Peruans, Argentina, not the Salazar, Spain. Well, Venezuela is pretty much an exclusion, but it couldn't be properly considered as a successful example of a succession. Just because everything is personal. Why, I mean, why he couldn't fire the deputy prime minister of Co, who is very stupid, very unpopular, and the host presence on the government creates an instant damage to, uh, to, 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 to the image of Putin himself and his government and so on. Well, because they share some common dark history back in 1991, doing some bad things around St. Petersburg uh, for, uh, for the authority. Well, and this is all very personal. That's fine. So, when he is gone, this regime couldn't be spared. There will be very turbulent time. There will be a competition for, for the succession. And our strategy is, in this sense, well, to be prepared. <coughs> to be the strongest, to be the best organized political force in the country at that moment. Then, I would say there are three possible scenarios which could lead to the, res to regi to the regime change. The first one, and we have to admit this, is a very biological scenario. I mean, we discussed all the problems uh, the regime is facing now. These problems are large and uh, uh, still Oil is at 85 US dollars per barrel. They still have a plenty of money, they still have a plenty of power, they still have all their propaganda uh, in hand available. They still have like six years to go. So I, I I'm not saying like what, what we, uh, that all the processes that we are observing now will lead to uh, fresh pressure of the regime in, in one year. We have seen it in, in Zimbabwe or whatever. Uh, it could last for another 10 or 20 years. There is a very bad, very pessimistic scenario uh, that they are able to stabilize it and this will survive till Putin's death. I don't like this scenario, but it is probable. And we have seen a lot of regimes similar to Putin's, which haven't been overthrown, but have existed till the death of the great. The second scenario is some, well, black swan type event. Something happened, something very bad, very dramatic, and People just go out to the street, to the streets, it's overthrown for, for some, well, dramatic reasons. So, the retirement age reform was probably not yet close, uh, although uh, even the official, uh, the pro government posters, for the first time, have measured that like over 50% of the population were supportive of the uh, protest rallies. Still, we can't exclude something happens that really just pushes uh, people out on the streets and that's all, that's it. And the third scenario is uh, about the internal struggle. 
the uh, that the alliance do not need anymore the existing consensus, the existing structure. With uh, they when they feel that the downsides of uh, keeping the current arbitrage system are larger than the upsides, and they. Uh, somehow organize the change from policy. I can't say which of, the, of these three scenarios is more probable. No one can. Uh, but our strategy is still the same. So we have to be prepared. We, we don't know uh, which of these three scenarios will come from? But when it happens, the first, the second, or the third, we still have to be, well, the best organized political power in the country to be able to uh, get as much people as possible out on the streets to demand for a regime change, for a fair election, and so on, so on, so on. And then, of course, we have to work we can't influence the probability of the first and second scenario, but we can work on increasing the probability of the third one, which is to increase stress. I mean, to, to create stress for for, for crime, for the regime, for the political elite. People put under stress do mistakes. People put under stress do stupid things. We have to do this. We have to use every opportunity just to increase the level of stress and turbulence, like we did with the determinant age before. Okay, it was, it didn't exist, it was not on, uh, on the table, then they announced it, and we converted all our regional offices uh, to the, well, headquarters of the protest, and we, uh, all our regional offices did nothing for four months, but organizing those protests to increase the level of the pressure. Good news is that two uh, strategies, two, two parts of the strategies, are very much coherent. They help each other. So when you do something, when you do this political campaign or that political campaign, if you disturb them participating in an election, or if you uh, pressurize them organizing the protests, or if you do some political campaign, uh, do some anti-corruption investigation, whatever. It helps you to grow as an organization. I mean, people see you are doing something. And people join you, and we see this increase. So, before the presidential campaign, although not successful technically, well, we had 200,000 emails in our mailing list, we were able to crowdfund for maybe 30 or 40 stuff. We had only one regional office in St. Petersburg. After the campaign, we have over 1 million emails. We are able to crowdfund for over 100 stuff. We are able to run over 40 regional offices. So we have scaled up as a political organization. Just by doing something, people join you for this. And when people join you and when you grow as a political organization, you can uh, you can get more pressure. You can uh, organize larger projects, larger campaigns. What we are doing now, like a countrywide rally when people turn out in like 80 or 90 cities, it was also impossible just two years ago. The first rally of that kind happened only 18 months ago, on uh, March 26, 2017. Now, it's something that we actually could really organize very easily. So these two strategies help each other. We grow because of our activities. And our activities are more are getting more effective because we grow. And this all I hope, increases the probability of, of the third scenario. 
but still we have to admit there is a chance we'll have to wait for the first or the second. I don't like this, uh, but it's still something that could happen. Well, that's the general idea of what we are doing, what, what, how we are considering the future, and let's go to your questions and see where they bring us. Thank you. I'm very sorry for my English. For some reason, it's even more terrible than usual today. I, I have to improve. I don't know why. Uh, it's, it's so bad today. But hopefully, you still were able to, to catch the run. Sorry. Good evening. Uh, I'll do my now I will really do my best. Okay, uh, I'll do my best to speak louder. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. It's fascinating. And also thank you for outlining these like three possible scenarios. And uh, you said that you actually prefer to increase pressure to make the third one yes. real. So, uh, and you discussed the struggle of the elites, the internal struggle of the elites, uh, but you did not mention one set of actors uh, I could think about that can be one of the very serious participants in the struggle, which is the security services and the military. So how do you see the role of the Russian security services and the military in case if your pressure works actually and the struggle takes place? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, it's a quite common fear that, well, there is somewhere the almighty FSB that actually would take would retake the power. It's, it's somehow also uh, accented by the propaganda. Like, well, uh, there is a famous propaganda line that yeah, Putin is the only liberal in the government, the only pro-European guy in the government. He's kind of saving the country from those Siloviki who would otherwise uh, create some very, very dark regime and so on. Well, first, the regime is dark enough. <coughs> Second, uh, Russia is not Turkey or South Korea or Venezuela. It's not a country historically where, where, where military or well, the Soviet historical play a role. You can look back to 1991. I mean, there was a, a revolution of a very, very large scale revolution when they just set down very, very very long, very cowardly, waiting for which side will win, and then and then took their side. That military that had that had been actually like much stronger, less corrupt maybe than, than the current one, more ideological, and still they decided not to participate. Unlike it happens like in, in Turkey, where the military is a. Uh, Guarantee of the constitution by the constitution, unlike it happens in, in Brazil, South Korea, some, some other countries. So, this is an historical argument. Then, there is a very recent argument that you don't have to overestimate their professional level <coughs> based on what happened in the UK. And, third, they are also very pragmatical, those guys. Well, there is no uh, uh, FSB general who wouldn't have villa in France or a chalet in, in Switzerland, which makes them very vulnerable. They have to think about like uh, protecting those assets and protecting their future. So my, of course I can't prove this, but my prediction is so that if something starts to happen, they will just leave the country and live a very happy life somewhere on Côte d'Azur. And that's it. And, and, and that's OK. We'll, we'll be fine without them. So uh, they are, to that extent, not ideological. Not uh, the, to that extent, it's cynical. I really can't imagine them fighting for for what for Putin. No, I don't have any experience of talking to you know, FSB guys or so on. But I have a lot of experience of talking to the well to, to the police 
I use every possibility. Every time I'm arrested, I spend a lot of time talking to them. Well, at least 80% of them are very supportive of what we are doing and not supportive of, of, of the government. It's, it's really not, not the force they could rely on. Of course, this, this ratio is somewhat different, probably among the well, FSB and some like white collar celebrity. But still, I wouldn't overestimate their venture. I'm curious about specific ways your organization has encountered state, um, state revenues and propaganda in the day to day or <coughs> Well, there is, no, there is no specific way. There is one way that we well, can be invented during the Moscow 2013 campaign. It's people are our media. So, uh, one uh, less known fact is that they, I mean, they usually say, and people usually think, that Navalny supporters are very young, right? But the fact, less known fact, is that the largest amount of votes during the 2013 Moscow mayoral elections, we've got among women 45 plus. It was the largest uh, <coughs> part of our support. So, why? Because we don't have access to television, radio, newspapers, uh, uh, billboards or whatever. So our idea in 2013 was that we use people as the media. So young volunteers came coming to the campaign offices, uh, well, supporting our cause and then talking, talking to their parents, talking to their friends, to their colleagues, talking on social media. And well, that's that's a very good way to fight the propaganda because I mean, uh, if I have this source of news and this source of news is sometimes not so easy to decide which is the fake news and which I should do. But if your friend is talking to you, it's much more reliable than the, any media, even, even the state-sponsored media, even, even the most efficient propaganda. You can rely on what your friend or your relative is talking to you. People, people usually do. And we realized, based on Moscow election outcome, that this media has been the most effective. This media actually allowed us to reach to about 30% of uh, voters in Moscow, very different ages in the province. And then what we started doing uh, in the next years, we were just replicating this model to our to other, uh, well, now from, from Moscow country. So we replicated the way of operations, the atmosphere, the everything of our Moscow campaign offices of 2013 or 85 cities during 2017. That, that's what we did. I have a question about a potential or outcome um, in which cynical elites adopt and see the success of your anti-corruption message and adopt that in, say, 2024 or at some point in time, gain power and then essentially use a uh, model similar to President Xi in China and basically use the auspices of reform and anti-corruption to dismantle the old system and then basically put their own personal relationships and basically restart the Putin system from scratch. So once again, uh, who does this? Yeah. Who, who, who adopts this way? So who Putin adopts this? No. Okay. Good. It's a good point, but uh, thank you for this question. But there is one very important difference. With, uh, between Russia and China, and why actually we are stuck with this anti-corruption agenda? Why we are, why we keep pushing this agenda? Why it's doing so permanent damage to them? Because they can't do anything against this. Because corruption is how the country is operated. It's a very basic operational method. I mean, if you could. Mark with a radioactive sign, with, with, with a radioactive mark, a sudden trouble bill. You you hand a road policeman. You will kind of be able to trace this this marker to Mr. President himself. So it's it's just the way the system operates. This this policeman is bribing you, uh, is, is collecting his bribe from you. 
not only because, well, he wants to enrich himself, but also because he has some, some plan, some KPI, some target. Like, he has to collect, I don't know, 30,000 rubles a day because he has to give 15,000 to, uh, to his boss. And that one has to um, force his uh, ground force, his, his, his officers, to collect those bribes because he has to repay to his superior. And that guy also has no choice because he actually had uh, purchased his uh, his, his, his nomination, uh, his office, and he has somehow to, to, to cover those expenses, and so on, so on. And it goes from the very low to, to the very high level in every vertical, not, not only among the well, police force, but everywhere in, in uh, development, building roads and bridges, and so on, so on, so on. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very basic structure. And that's why it's uh, unpleasant for them when, when someone talks about corruption. I mean, if you would talk about, I don't know, yeah, I mean, if we would build our campaign on bad roads or bad hospitals, which, which is both the fact, I could imagine, well, it would be a hard challenge for them, but I could imagine at some point they realize, okay, the danger is so large, from our side, okay, we'll forget about uh, some part of money we could steal and we would invest heavily in uh, making roads or hospitals better and kind of to get us rid of this part of the agenda. But they can't do it with the, with the corruption itself. That, that's, well, at least that's my, my feeling. If Putin suffers a massive heart attack tomorrow and dies, what would happen? Are you ready for this? Okay. That's, that's a good question. So isn't it too early? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think yes. I think yes. So, once again, uh, the, the system is run on, on, on negative selection. So there is no one popular. Putin doesn't share his popularity with someone, it's, it's also essential for them not to, to, to have anyone um, other who could like, pretend uh, to be the first man. Uh, so there will be well, several uh, possible pretenders who will start well, to fight against each other. And I think that the, the this event would move well the, the people the, the masses to, the, to that extent that yes I would predict in that case we already would be ready to, to, to get a lot of people on the street to, to demand the re-election on which would be fair as like anyone admitted and I also think we would be strong enough to win such a re-election maybe I'm too optimistic maybe we should wait another a couple of years. <laughs> Um, oops. Uh, I'm going to ask you about the foreign uh, policing aspects, perhaps some debt that it has uh, on you as um, the position. Um, so the sanctions are obviously necessary. Um, and uh, impose costs, so to speak, on Russia right for its behavior. But on the other hand, um, sanctions mobilize the society, the regime successfully uses anti-Western sentiments for um, legitimizing its existence, for mobilizing that massive. Um, and you know, times are, times are tough, um, as Posner said earlier today in Yale, workers come together to mobilize mm -hmm. they, um, they, they, they can extend uh, the hardship and mobilize around the region. And on the other hand, uh, well, what you have is, um, do you think the sanctions can change the cost-benefit calculations for the elite in the sense, in the unlikely scenario where you have big demonstrations, say in Moscow, and the authoritarian regime is faced with a uh, dilemma whether or not to flee, and now with so many people under sanctions and unable say, to have 
poverty in the West and lead to the West. Do you think sanctions have the effect of entrenching the regime? Yeah, thank you. That's a very important, very good question. Uh, well, first of all, I completely agree with you that most of the sanctions we have seen before only, only mobilized the regime and gave actually a lot of, uh, uh, well, talking points for the propaganda. Like, well, you see, the Cold War is here again. The West is trying to ruin our economy. Putin is only one who can protect us, so we have to strengthen strengthen ourselves and, and support him and uh, he, well, and, and so on and so on. The first time sanctions were somehow, I would say, effective uh, was the last round of sanctions, the personal ones, against the oligarchs, against the Ibascalics and so on. Because Kremlin's propaganda is, of course, very effective, very sophisticated, very, very efficient, very sophisticated. They, um, well, they could very easily do things that were not possible even for the Soviet propaganda. Like, they can really, like, very, very 1984 style explain that 2 plus 2 equals 5 and so on. But there are some things out of their reach even now. And one of these things is to explain that oligarchs are good, that we have to uh, like we, we we have to support them and to protect them. I mean, it was such an important talking point for the propaganda to blame everything on the nineties and the, on on the oligarchs. That they can't do such a flip right now to say, well, you have to spend, you have to earn less and spend less to to protect the past. I mean, it's, they, they, they were just silent. Actually, the propaganda was just saying nothing on these last sanctions, which, to my opinion, contributed to the lot of the scenario. This, all these guys uh, realized Putin is not going to protect them. It affected the cost benefit um, relation. Also, for those of them not affected by this run of the sanctions, because what we see now, uh, propaganda is silent, is not supporting the revascular emerge. The government is trying to do something. Like uh, just yesterday's, just yesterday they uh, announced they will once again allow to use aluminium uh, electric wires in the houses, which is dangerous which was prohibited, but which supports the Rubaski a lot because, well, he is the main producer of uh, aluminum. So they are ready to, to steps like, like that. But they won't say it like official, like it's not our strategy to protect the Rubaski. Well, this makes those oligarchs not yet affected, like, I don't know, Friedman or uh, Avon or whatever, um, whoever. To think, well, okay, so now Putin does not publicly protect those under sanctions, but tries to kind of redistribute money in their favor. Would he do something for us? Would he redistribute some of the resources for us when we are affected by the next round of sanctions? <laughs> this, is, this is a question they try to figure it out and answer for, and I don't know what, what they are answer they are now. Um, uh, getting for this question. So, we have seen that this last round of personal sanctions has actually made those others very, very comfortable. Like uh, Abramovich uh, uh, getting the Israel citizenship uh, means moving to, to, to France, I think. And a lot of other guys doing some very nervous steps. So from Putin's point of view, should probably be considered as a as a prison. Like <coughs> rats jumping shape, right? So I would say that this uh, idea, the idea of personal sanctions, really uh, 
influences probability for the source scenario, increases probability of the source scenario, and I'm very supportive. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you about the possible foreign policies uh, you have in your mind as uh, one of the leaders of the, of the Russian opposition. In my understanding, the main factors of Russian foreign policy include something like a strong emphasis on <coughs> territorial integrity or self-awareness as a great power or, uh, or maintaining the uh, autonomy, autonomy of the uh, Russian foreign policy or a strong relationship with both the Soviet states and so on. Uh, which are, I, think, I, I understand, represented in the uh, Constitution as well. And uh, 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 so uh, I, I'd like to know what kind of cha changes shall we see if you or your party achieve the regime change in oh. terms of direction of the process? Well, yeah, first of all, yeah, thank you, but I'm not, of course, that, that, that kind of uh, well, foreign policy guy. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. more for the political operation inside the country. But uh, what I could say, like 2017, we spent the whole year building our political operation inside the country. I went to, I think, 60 uh, of our regional offices out of 85. So uh, Alexei did pretty, pretty much the same. So I was talking, and he was talking to maybe 30,000 of our supporters and volunteers in, in person, maybe even 50,000. And we are also taking questions from them. So, I mean, we have to do what our supporters want us to do, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we, we want to get democratically elected and we want to uh, follow uh, what, they, what, what, what they want from us. And they are, of course, also touching the external policy issues. And they don't like this idea of Russia being a great superpower again, like competing for its place in the multipolar world and so on. One of the most important, actually, I mean, actually, one of the most important talking points of uh, Alexei in every city he visited, the talking point which faced the most applause from the audience was like, I don't understand why they are reconstructing roads in Palmyra and not reconstructing roads in, in Omsk, if it was in Omsk, or in Chelyabinsk, if it was in Chelyabinsk. And people were like getting really crazy about this, crazy supporting this idea. I mean, people don't understand this idea of a uh, of, uh, country where people really, well, uh, leave in very bad conditions now, spending enormous money, efforts, and now also lives for something they really don't understand. Yeah, of course, this post-Soviet nostalgia is still important. I mean, uh, Baltic countries were very successful because they don't have this trauma. Uh, people don't wake up in Vilnius, regretting the fact they cannot anymore be in charge of, of Tashkent. While, while in Moscow, still a lot of people do. But this is, this is failing out. With this generation change, it's getting not anymore that important. And for the operations, uh, apart from the post-Soviet uh, uh, region, it's very clear that people just don't understand this. I mean, Putin was, I mean, speaking quite cynically of, of approvals and points, Putin was very successful with uh, this with, uh, with, uh, with, with accession of Crimea and with Ukraine. It gave him a lot. I mean, just technical. But Syria, no. Syria was not a success by, by, by any means. I mean, propaganda, of course, tried to emphasize that, well, we are once again a very important superpower like we achieved something America and uh, America's allies were not able to achieve and so on and so on. People were not back at this. Okay. I'll try to use some of those assets. They <laughs> somehow appeared here. So uh, I have a question regarding um, your internal beliefs. So how do you identify um, your political movement 
uh, according to, to the standard political model spectrum. Who are Mr. Volkov and Mr. Navalny according to their internal beliefs and your ambition? Or in other words, if to paraphrase some of your uh, political opponents, which five or six professions you would identify as the most important from the, the most ancient, I would say? So, six? Uh, well, three or five professions you would identify the most important out of the most ancient, as uh, one of your political ah. uh, <coughs> opponent told us. Uh, well, okay. So could you tell us more about your, you know, political uh, vision yeah, actually, for the future? Uh, yeah, actually, actually, I think that uh, a lot of the states are committed when people try to think of Russian politics in terms of standard models, trying to identify, like, well, if, if Putin is a centrist or right or left, because we just don't have those coordinates. And, uh, and all these kind of metaphors are usually very, very, very big. Well, I would say that So if I would be an American citizen, if it, it, it would be quite complicated for me to, to, to vote in an American election. Uh, because, I mean, here, uh, supporting a free, entrepreneur, a free entrepreneurship somehow goes together with, well, prohibiting abortion, something like that. So it's, it's, it's something. I mean, it's it's very complicated to comprehend Russian politics from 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 this uh, from from American view, viewpoints because you can't really like attribute uh, the parties and the movements on the, the scale uh, 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 which people use here. But it's also quite complicated to for us to understand what's going on here. So. If I would, if I would be a German citizen, I would vote uh, FDP. If you if you know that, that that's easy. They they have like they have six political parties, and you can uh, easily find this vote. But uh, so we are definitely liberals in terms of like, political rights, in terms of well, human rights, freedom of speech, etc., etc. And still we consider uh, the injustice. Mm. Uh, as the main uh, challenge to the Russian now. I mean, the country, the country that rich just can't operate with, with the highest Gini index in the world. Uh, it's, it, it, it creates so much like long-term problems. It's a perception of injustice. There is a, is a Moscow uh, Bentley dealership is the best-selling one in the world. And still, like 40% of the population uh, earn le less than $200 a month. So uh, it's so we were very heavily criticized for our minimum wage requirements, for uh, our requirements on, on pensions, so on. But we really believe it's it's very essential. So uh, the country just couldn't be operated uh, in the way it's operated now. <laughs> because of corruption, because of the injustice, so on. And these are some very basic problems we have to overcome to, to be able uh, to create a competitive political system where we could have a meaningful discussions between like libertarians or conservatives and liberals and uh, like US style Democrats and US style Republicans. So we are, we are just well a step behind now. So, probably it's not an answer for your question, but, but uh, I doubt this question actually has an easy answer. Uh, for the professions, we definitely think the most important profession is that one of the, te uh, of the teacher. Uh, I mean, still, now, after those 30 years, Russia still has enormous uh, human capital. And we should take care of it and, and invest in it. It's of course 
absolutely clear for us, and it's been a main talking point of our political program for the presidential election, uh, that, uh, well, we have to be prepared to the post-industrial world, so where the most important value is our, our human and their knowledge, and like knowledge based, based economy, all those passwords, only that for us, this is uh, not only the passwords, but also the beliefs. Thank you uh, for today. And so you mentioned, or it kind of was a counterpoint to my colleague in the line here. So if Putin doesn't die this week, but he does. You're so optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it is, as you say, potentially another 25 years, um, and you mentioned for the, the challenge for him is this growing gap, right? Yeah. Age gap. So with, at the same time, you also mentioned diminishing opportunities, so closing space for protests. If you're continuing this closing space for the next 20 years, what is your hope for leadership among the opposition whenever the possibility does arise that you have a moment? Well, I can't imagine. It's, it's within their reach that at one point they decide uh, the risks for them uh, from, well, uh, keeping the idea of like, political freedom and political competition is higher than the uh, Mm, risks they take just shutting all down. So I can imagine they take the decision to like arrest everyone and to shut down all our regional offices and to make probably most of our uh, party members to, to go to Excel. This is possible, but it never before uh, safety and in regime and health and in regime to, to, to postpone uh, its uh, existence. So it is unfortunately quite a probable course of action, uh, quite a probable scenario that they will increase the pressure even more. Actually, it's, it's once again something what's happening. So uh, during the campaign, uh, they arrested us for an enormous amount of times, but there were never criminal charges. There was always those administrative arrests for 15 days or 30 days. So right after the campaign, right after the presidential election, whereas they didn't feel like, well, we have to pretend we have a political competition, they started to uh, press criminal charges uh, against our uh, campaign staffers. We have already five of the campaign staffers exiled because of the well, possible um, uh, criminal prosecution. And this could, of course, scale up. But on the well, long-term historical scale, this is not going to change anything. Well, OK, I mean, um, I can't imagine, I can't imagine them even well, taking the decision to like, put Alexei to, to prison for five years. It's, it's, it's all in their hands. Well, would it decrease his approval rate? No. He would be the guy sent to prison for being the only guy to protecting uh, poor people from the retirement age before. The, I, mean, long, I mean, this could probably also sound a bit cynical, but long term, uh, this actually damages the regime much more than us. Uh, yeah, so. When you're talking about the establishment of this Putin-centric uh, regime, what was the public perception of it? And then also, as we're seeing more grassroots support for your opposition movement, is that indicating that people are understanding what's going on in Russia and more critical of it? Uh, the first part of the question. So when Putin was putting together this regime, this corrupt, oligarch-based regime, what were people thinking about that? Oh, people were, yeah, okay. Uh, the answer is people were not thinking that much about it. People were just uh, surviving. And then uh, this coincided <coughs> with an enormous economic growth of uh, yeah. 2000 to 2008, uh, where was the well, most successful and prosperous years for the economy, mostly because of the oil prices, but who cares? We had Putin, and we had, I mean, in 2008, people in Russia 
technically. We're all living as good as never before. Like, never. Uh, not, not never in the last 10 years, but never in the last 1,000 years. Uh, and this coincided with uh, Putin like, gaining more power, and yeah, people often take wrong decisions and see wrong connections between, between cause and consequence. They saw that this, is, that this economic growth happened because Putin was centralizing power, uh, yeah, canceling the regional elections, prohibiting uh, political parties, and so on and so on. Of course, it was not true, but it, it has been the perception. Perception is important. So, Putin was very successful in concentrating the power uh, because, because of the kind of growth. And when the growth came to the end, he was already power enough and his propaganda was already strong enough to explain people that the growth is continuing, that everything is fine. So before 2008, uh, he was basically selling this growth. After 2008, he is selling stability, like, which is actually a stagnation. But once again, as people still live quite good compared uh, to what was before, uh, this talking point was also uh, anticipated. Now, they cannot sell stability anymore because actually the, uh, uh, the life quality has decreased uh, to very much extent during the last four or five years. Well, they are selling protection against, against the West, against the uh, external threat. What will, what will be the next talking point for them? Well, I don't know. It's um, a final question. <laughs> Trying to make it good. Uh, <laughs> as, yeah, most of the questions are very good. Thank you very much. Just kind of a fairly specific question. Um, you mentioned the pension reforms and some of the things that the Kremlin is now doing as part of a, a broader set of economic reforms. Where do you and the opposition stand on some of those? Do you see those as necessary reforms? Would you do something differently, just in terms of kind of the, the economy in Russia right yeah, now? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, of course, the pension reform is now the most important one. It's, it's just, I mean, there, there exists no other political agenda in Russia currently uh, but the pension reform. And as they say, well, it's necessary. We just have a huge deficit in the pension fund, in the national pension fund. We have no choice but to dramatically increase the retirement age. And they also pretend, well, if, like, if Navalny would be president, he would also have no other choice. That's, of course, not true. I mean, once again, the oil is now at 85, as it has been, like, in in the most prosperous years, in, in, in 28, and there was enough money, there is not more enough. That's because the system, this mafia system, uh, is now much more efficient than it has been before. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, well, when the oil price was at 50, the life has been decent, and when the oil price, oil price was at 80, the extra money kind of managed to squeeze through the bureaucracy and to pour on the, well, on the population in terms of increase of pensions, of salaries, or some repairs in the infrastructure. So now, if it's 80, or even if it would be 150, they still manage to distribute this all extra money among themselves. So they've built a system efficient enough to steal like everything. Their children are growing, the new generations of people who want to have a longer yacht and a better private jet uh, has grown up. And I mean, there is no such point as a saturation point. You can't, contrary to what most of the voters in Russia think, you can't steal much enough. That's never enough. First. Second, uh, 
So, I mean, the, the corruption burden on the economy, it's, it's not so easy to, to give a precise estimate, but, well, the average kickback for a broad construction tender yeah, for, 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 to, 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 to win a competition uh, for procurement was around 5% back in 2002, 2004. It's around 7% now in 2018. So that's, that's how the corruption burden on the, on the economy, on the budget, uh, has grown. Even if you managed to decrease it twice, so from 70% to 35, it's enough to cover all the deficit of the pension fund for, for years now. Well, and then there is a second part uh, uh, that's most, more specific, but also important point that they have to make. that. Uh, well, we could discuss the uh, retirement system, retirement age reform, if there would be a discussion, if the government would not just announce it, but come public with some figures, with some numbers, with some arguments. This never happened. So they just said, we have no choice but to do so. They never presented what is actually a choice. Because, well, there is, of course, so, for instance, we have a whole cast, a whole class of all this silly uh, kid of the, all the military and the, so on and so on, uh, who retired 40 or 45, and their pensions are pretty much triple, uh, uh, three times higher as, a, uh, as an average. So we have like 43 millions. Uh, 43 million people uh, getting the uh, state pensions. Only 6 million of them, so 15% of them, uh, get this uh, special pension because of for being like uh, former policemen or for, for former prosecutors, former military, and so on. But this, this, this 6 million people get pretty much 40 to 45 percent of all the retirement fund money. So we could discuss this distribution. Maybe it should be made more fair. We could discuss a lot. Maybe we should just uh, change the taxes for the oil and gas companies and redistribute those money to the pension funds like they do it in Norway. It could be a discussion, but the government never offered a discussion. Please join me in thanking Thank you very much. Once again, I hope it's not, not too boring. And thank you for the questions that are really very interesting and, and in depth. I'm delighted to see such a level of, of comprehension of what's going on in Russia here and at the lecture. Thank you very much for the great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, everyone's welcome to grab snacks.